Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our viewing audience and to our distinguished guests to the third in our series of six conversations on the future of public safety. Today's topic is public safety beyond the police station, and we're extraordinarily pleased to have six distinguished guests to talk with us today. Uh, at this moment of reawakening on racial justice and police practices in America, uh, it's incredibly important that we try to find, as President Mason said in the first of these sessions, dialogue across difference. And so we're really looking forward to digging in today with experts who are going to talk to us about the ecosystem of reform, thinking beyond the police station, as has already come up in the first two conversations in this series. By way of introduction, uh, here are our guests. First, Dr. Leanna Wen, the former Baltimore Health Commissioner. Welcome, Dr. Wen. Thank you very much. We have Eric Gonzalez, the District Attorney of Brooklyn. Hello, everyone. How are you, DA Gonzalez? We have the Chief of Police in Dallas, Renee Hall. Hi, thank you for having me. We have Candace Jones, the president and CEO of the Public Welfare Foundation. Good to be with you, James. Hey, Candace. And we have David Kennedy, the director of the National Network for Safe Communities at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. James, everybody after this. Great to see you. And we also have joining us hopefully later, David Muhammad, the executive director of the National Institute for Criminal Justice Reform. So with that, we will dive right in. And I want to bring up first D.A. Gonzalez and Dr. Wen and David Kennedy to start with some definitions. Uh, in our prior conversations, one of the things that's been most important is just to level set and take a step back in this moment of dialogue and very public debate about where we're going in terms of policing practices, in terms of racial justice, in terms of community engagement towards a future of public safety and define what do we actually mean by public safety? And given your various vantage points as prosecutor, scholar, practitioner, public health official, uh, I'd love to hear from each of you how you define public safety and what you, you would like to cue in the public's mind, in the mind of legislators, advocates, and community when we say public safety. Let's start with, uh, with Dean Gonzalez. Well, for me, um it's important that we actually listen to the communities we serve to actually understand what public safety is. And, and it's my experience that public safety uh, means different things in different communities to different people. And so we, ha we have to acknowledge that there's not a singular standard. I mean, obviously people want to be free from violent crime. People want uh, fairness in their justice system. But the solutions that will get us to where people feel that they're safe. It's to me depends on listening to our communities about what they want it, um, from law enforcement. Uh, often law enforcement um, proposes solutions and says this is what you need to keep our community safe. And we have to acknowledge that we have to do different things. So uh, the solutions may look differently um, in different neighborhoods but the, what it takes for people to have that sense of security, um, to get around their communities without the threat of violence um, means different things to them. And so uh, the definition of safety is a, a, a place where you feel comfortable um, living your life um, free from violence, but also um, not concerned about being, uh, you know, over, uh, over police as well, and so uh, we're we're hearing um, many many different people tell us that they you know some communities um, they feel that policing is very necessary, um, and in other communities they're looking for other solutions than calling nine one one, and we have to be open to different uh, different ways of doing the job of keeping people safe. I love that. Thanks so much, Diego Gonzalez. The idea that public safety isn't unitary, we have to be open to different approaches, I think is really important. Uh, Dr. Wen, if I could bring you in for this. Absolutely. So, of course, I agree with Diego Gonzalez in tailoring the needs to the specific community, to the individuals that we're serving. I come from a public health background. And so, of course, I see public health and public safety, those two concepts as intertwined. 
And I actually want to bring this up um, too, because I think Diego Gonzalez is very well said about um, already about what safety might mean. Of course, I think this also means that you have to feel safe um, for your health and well being. And that's intricately tied to the concept of safety. But, you know, there's something in this conversation that I'm sure we'll, we'll get to later, but I just want to bring up about scope because we, I'm an ER doc, and in the ER, we also have an issue that I think many people in the public safety and the policing space may, may encounter, which is that we feel like we are not only just doing the job that we are trained to do, as in we resuscitate patients in their time of need in the ER, but there are all these other problems with our society that we in the ER become the ultimate safety net but we're often not resourced in order to do that as in issues of homelessness, issues of mental health, issues of, of, of addiction. These are all things that of course, there is a medical component and we need to address it from the medical side. But so much of how we got to where we are also involves failures in our society writ large. And we in the ER then have to figure out, well, how can we treat these patients who really need our help? I actually think it's a corollary to what many teachers face in schools, that in addition to being teachers, so many people have to also be social workers too. And we see this with policing as well, that there are so many issues that are failures of society that ultimately get pinned on police officers to address these issues. And so all this is to say, because public safety, public health have to do with all these other issues, everything is intertwined. But it also means that we as a society have to do a better job of thinking through what is it that we mean? How can we work in partnership? And how do we ensure that those who are the most vulnerable don't fall through yet another one of our cracks? I love that. The ideas of scope and resourcing and then also partnership uh, I have themes that have already started to come up and that we definitely want to dig into today. Thank you, Dr. Wen. And uh, David Kennedy, it uh, would be great to get your perspective here. Um, it's, it's, a really, it's a real pleasure to be in these conversations with really good people um, because it lets, it's let, it lets one say what they said. Um, so what they said, absolutely. Um, now, I, I am fundamentally uh, a, a violence prevention person. Uh, that's what I've always focused on. That's what, what my national network at John Jay focuses on. Um, and, you know, the traditional frame for violence prevention has essentially been, you know, people should not be vulnerable to, or not, not be afraid of their family, their neighbors, um, people in their community. That's, that's right. Um, it is also incredibly important that that families and neighbors and communities not be afraid of their government. And in in all sorts of ways, part of the the dramatic and really, really important shift in in the national consciousness over the last little while, um, maybe beginning with, with the recognition, the broad recognition of, of the incredible toxicity of, of mass incarceration, um, moving um, in, into other elements of, of the criminal justice system. Uh, DA Gonzalez is, is part of a very conscious uh, new generation of progressive prosecutors who are focusing profoundly on on the harms that can be done by by those offices in into this national moment of of outrage around police misconduct and police violence you know you can you can sum all of that up as uh, people people are being harmed by their own government they want they want not to be harmed by their government they want not to be harmed by the, the institutions and actions of, of state authority and state power. They want public safety to, to come out of, you know, not, not primarily um, the, the remedial actions of police and the criminal justice system or even remedial actions of, of other parts of the state. They want the kind of investments and, and attention that will create thriving communities that will produce public safety. 
they want as as much of of prevention and intervention and correction as possible to come out of community action and and not out of the actions of of state power and they want healthy state institutions and healthy relationships with state institutions and a good deal of what we've we've been been seeing in this explosion of of this this new new wave of civil rights activism around the country is a, a profound statement that people do not think that the the institutions of state power are healthy they do not think those relationships are are healthy and they they, they don't want to live like this any longer thanks so much for for that david uh, the idea that people shouldn't be afraid of their government violence reduction and fear reduction and then healthy institutions relationship to healthy institutions and the, the fact that that so many feel that our state institutions are unhealthy is a critical piece of this puzzle and i actually want to pick up on that with chief hall with candace and david muhammad if if we can um, to dig in on uh, as david termed it what we're hearing from communities right now and would love to get all three of your perspectives on what you're hearing in your respective positions as advocate, police chief, president of a philanthropy, uh, what are you hearing right now in terms of community need? And how do we start to think about meeting those needs? And let's start with you, Ken. Okay, good. Listen, I want to answer that question. I'd love to start in part by responding to what the last group said, which is, I think, just as a framing answer, I think it's so important to say we all know what it feels like to feel safe in a community. It's a place where, you know, they're thriving businesses and restaurants, where our roads are paid, where the evidence of investment is really clear. That's sort of when we're all walking down the street, we're saying, oh, I feel safe. That's what happens. And the truth, so that we just get really frank, is that we know that too often in urban communities of colors and also sometimes rural, uh, white and impoverished communities, the evidence of that investment is lacking. Because none of us, I think, have ever felt particularly safe just by being able to visibly see a mass collection of law enforcement. Like that is not the thing that I think we all think about when we're describing what sort of uh, we what makes us safe. And so I think a lot of what we're seeing right now is this tension about communities that, by and large, for a long time, have seen that underinvestment and therefore over reliance on one system, which is our criminal justice. And so I think it's going to be really important as we move forward. And so much of what we are hearing from our grantees and partners is sort of increasingly this clamoring call for meaningful investment. And I think some folks are funding it in a way that says what they want to see less of. But increasingly, you're also seeing people start to articulate what they'd like to see more of, which I think is going to be critically important. And frankly, that I also think will be something that systems leaders, myself and I know David Muhammad as well, former systems leaders, who have really turned the tide and work that they've done have also been big champions of saying, it is as much important for me to have a handle on the purview of my department or agency, but also to be really strategic about how I advocate in that systems role to ensure that investment goes to these other places where without a strong continuum of care, we are in the best position to do our jobs. I love it. Two things I take from that, that we know what it feels like to feel safe. And the right previous panelists framed it as this is not rocket science, but it's incredibly hard to do. Uh, and that I think is important to keep front and center of conversation. The investment in systems and the connectivity between systems and actively making sure that, that we do have that uh, institutional dialogue is so important. Uh, Chief Hall, can I come to you on this one? Yes, I, I, thank you. Uh, and I just um, am grateful to be a part of this panel today and a part of this discussion. I want to kind of piggyback on something Candace said, as well as Dr. Wynn. Um, and Dr. Wynn started with scope. Uh, and so when we talk about the scope of law enforcement, public safety, uh, community, I think we need to figure out um, who describes what. What is the scope of public safety for the community versus what is the scope of public safety for law enforcement. Oftentimes, uh, the community's expectations and what the design of, the, of, of, of law enforcement was intended to do are totally different. Right now, law enforcement has three core competencies. That is 
responding to our calls for service, making sure that we're servicing our communities, uh, addressing crime, both proactively and reactively, and investigating crime for follow-up and bringing those individuals who commit crime to justice. But we have been tasked with everything from mental illness, homelessness, animal control, youth, uh, we have so many responsibilities. It's like being a jack of all trades. When you're a jack of all trades, you're a master of none. So we have so many responsibilities in law enforcement um, that we are responding uh, in a way that allows our community to feel over-policed. And that's because we have not as a society dealt with the core issues of crime and safety. It is statistically proven that Poverty is a direct correlation of crime, yet the only person at the table or the only entity at the table is law enforcement. So we are forced to be in those communities that have high volumes of crime, uh, stressing and, and over-policing, at least that is the perception of our community, that we're providing that over-policing when that is our requirement. Our communities, our elected officials are screaming, there's drug dealing there's robbery, there's shootings in our areas, and we're required to be in that space. But we recognize that there has to be other resources, jobs, education, training, opportunities in order for there to uh, eliminate the need for police in that space. And we recognize that these are areas that are communities of color. And so the challenge for us in law enforcement is making sure that we're addressing all of the concerns um, and we are the only ones at the table addressing all of those concerns. We need our elected officials, our clergy, our business owners, our philanthropic companies to come to the table and identify the core systemic issues that lie within crime and disorder that disrupt public safety and quality of life so that we can address those needs that are directly related to policing and all of the other concerns uh, are addressed in, in the much needed manner. Until we do this, police are showing up to mentally um, unstable individuals with tools on our belt that do not that, that, that do not allow us to properly respond. We show up with mace, with tasers, with batons and guns. And if that is not the outcome that you want from mental illness, a, a mental health call or a homeless call, then why are we the first responders? Why are we there? And so who's going to help the police to, to, to allow uh, for a great, great quality of life or better public safety for, for law enforcement, because we are responding to things that we shouldn't be. I think if you ask any police chief across this country, um, what would we rather be doing? We would rather be doing that which we were created to do. Uh, we recognize that when uh, policing was created, long time ago, slave patrols, there has been a lot of progressive movement to change who we are, community engagement, uh, community policing, and all 21st century policing practices that bring us uh, to a position of legitimacy and trust with our communities. But if we do not address those core uh, systematic things that, that plague our communities and keep them impoverished and uh, develop opportunities for crime, then where we what our perception is from our community is that we're back oppressing those individuals who have no other options. And so, you know, I, I say this because a year ago here in the city of Dallas, about a year and a half ago, I spoke to an increase in crime in our area. Uh, and one of the things that I spoke about was that we needed resources. We had individuals who were returning from uh, prison who had no jobs, no resources, and no opportunities. And I was crucified for saying that we need to step up and provide that so there are other options for these individuals. Today, we are having that conversation. We are pushing that conversation because we know that unless we do these things, unless we work together as a community, everybody working together, we're just going to make police or policing the responsibility or the, 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 the reason that we do not have the kind of unity and the kind of safety and order that we have in our communities. 
Thank you so much, Chief. And uh, if you can't hear me, just let me know. Having some tech challenges, as always, when you, we do live streams and Zooms. Uh, but I very much appreciate all of those points, in particular, the idea of scope being different for law enforcement and community, because that's the conversation we want to unpack. We've been talking about policing for decades. As long as there have been police, we've been trying to deconstruct what policing is how we do it better and how we make it equitable, particularly for black and brown communities who have disproportionately suffered from police violence, poverty, being in food deserts and not having the resources to live a healthy and thriving life. And so in coming to, to you, David, uh, I'd just like to get your follow-up and comment on this because I think we want to really dig into the to what Chief Hall just put on the table. Uh, what does it take to have a thriving community such that we can actually get to a, a conception of public safety that works for the community? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a very good point uh, in terms of, you know, how is the community a co-producer and even a lead in terms of public safety? Uh, and the other challenge is we have very different notions of what public safety means. Uh, what is community safety? What is neighborhood safety? Uh, and to Chief's Hall point and, you know, counterpoint in Sacramento, Chief Han, who's been out front and saying the police should not do all of these things we've been asked to do. And we've asked uh, law enforcement to do too much with uh, too little. Uh, but the other part of it is we also can't pay pennies on the dollar for community organizations, community services, community members uh, to pick up the slack, uh, if you will. So there must be real investment in developing community in addition to developing community services that replace or become alternatives to what law enforcement has traditionally responded to. And those are uh, slightly different uh, activities or efforts that both need to be funded uh, at scale. And so in terms of looking at what law enforcement is engaged in, uh, that they should no longer be engaged in responding to non-criminal calls, responding to cold case calls, dealing with noise complaints and animal issues and homelessness and mental health issues that are completely not criminal. Uh, there is a, a large slew of types of calls for service that law enforcement respond to now uh, that they shouldn't. Uh, and that largely, at least the leadership in law enforcement no longer want to do. Um, and so then we have to look at, well, what are the appropriate community responses? Obviously everyone's talking about cahoots from Eugene, Oregon and replicating that model. Uh, you know, if you're talking about mental health calls, but there is a number of calls, A, that there's a question about whether they should be responded to at all. And there's another level of calls where a trained, robust community force, if you will, or community response network uh, would be uh, much better at responding than separate. It is what is the what are the investments we need that would stop the need for calls? The, the investment in housing and employment and improved education and mental health services and drug treatment uh, and youth development uh, uh, programs, as well as investing in the very people, as the Chief Hall has talked about, folks coming home, returning citizens, formerly incarcerated folks, uh, to help them to develop into credible messengers where you can use these credible messengers to work with young people and young adults uh, before we ever get to the point of there being a need for a call uh, for service. And so we all know many of these models of, of, of crisis intervention, of violence interruption and violence intervention and life coaches and credible messengers, which are extraordinarily effective, but are have very little investment. So I know we wanna talk about getting to the budget issue but you have places where you have effective violence interruption intervention services getting 120th the investment of what law enforcement gets. And so we've got to look at uh, the issues of investment and parity so that there's collective uh, public safety uh, engaged in by community and law enforcement together. Public safety. Uh, this is only comes up far less regularly in my view than it should as a concept that we need to interrogate and dig into uh, if we're gonna move forward. And the idea of equitable investment really takes us into the next, next set of conversations I think we, we need to have, which is really about budget. Uh, and on this, um, and I wanna bring in uh, uh, David Kennedy and Dr. Wen, if we can, Charlie, the, uh, the call right now, the thing that we're seeing in headlines across the country is 
uh, some version of divest, abolish, or defund the police. And it's been described so many different ways, different people interpret those calls differently. Uh, but to my mind and what we've heard from our, our previous speakers in this panel, uh, it's really about how we think about the, the full budget, the full investment in our community and how resources are distributed with a finite pot. And so I'd love to get both of your perspectives on those calls to shift resources and what that looks like and where you think we should be putting them. Because so often we get up to the water's edge of uh, let's talk about it, but we don't dig into, into how we think about that within the, the confines of a finite pot. And obviously, Dr. Wen, um, you've been a public health official in Baltimore. Um, that's a, a perfect place for us to start. What has your experience been and what do you think we should be doing going forward? Oh, I have a lot to say on this. So thank you for for bringing up the the concept of a budget because we know that budgets determine our society's priorities, um, and this is a a good place for for uh, for us to go. So I want to tell you um, a couple of of statistics and and stories. Um, one, when I was the health commissioner in Baltimore, we had multiple years where the amount of overtime spent on police officers was more than the entire amount that the city provided for public health. I just want to say that again, more on police overtime than on the entirety of public health, which when I was the health commissioner, public health included not only mental health, but maternal and child health and senior centers and animal control and um, and, and disease prevention and the opioid epidemic. Um, you can imagine the entire and the entire scope of public health, the restaurant inspections, all of that was public health. Now I am, you know, I was also the health commissioner right after the death of Freddie Gray while in police custody. And there were, um, there was a consent decree and there were a lot of resources that needed to be invested in in our police department. So I'm not making a comment about how much should the city should have been spending on police, but I'm just saying that there is something really disproportionate about this when um, we had multiple speakers talk about the concept of prevention and also of what are the other societal supports that will prevent the need for policing in the first place and including these mental health resources, resources for individuals experiencing homelessness, addiction, et cetera. If we don't treat those issues, then there's going to be much more of a need potentially for policing, but when policing is actually not the most effective way of addressing that. So it was, as you can probably hear my voice, a great source of frustration. So I think that reimagining the public safety budget is important. I'm not necessarily saying we shouldn't fund the police department, but I am saying that we need to have a broader concept of what public safety is about and really think through who is best to be doing each part of this work and in partnership with one another. I mean, um, uh, David, I think, brought up this concept of violence interruption and using credible messengers, and I want to piggyback on that. One of the programs that I oversaw in the health department was Safe Streets, which is based on the national model of cure violence that was started in Chicago, and a number of, of cities across the country have this model. But the concept, at least for us, is that you hire credible messengers. These are individuals often who are recently released from incarceration, who are seen as the most trusted messengers. If I go on the streets of West Baltimore and tell people to not engage in conflict and put down their weapons, I'll be laughed at. And in many of these communities, the police is not going to be the most trusted when it comes to that type of violence interruption either. And so these trusted messengers are hired, they mediate conflicts, and we have shown time and time again in our city that every year, these safe streets um, community outreach workers mediate about a thousand conflicts and 80 percent of those conflicts were then later deemed to be likely or very likely to result in gun violence multiple of our safe street sites went through over a year without a fatal shooting even when sites around them the areas around them um, went through some of the worst times in uh, in our city's history when it came to violent crime and so all this is to say that this is a proven model that people cite uh, all over the country um, as something that's effective in reducing violence and reducing the traditional need for policing, if you will. And yet, time and time again, this program came within weeks of losing all of its funding, of having all of these individuals for whom this is a reentry program as well, of having all of these individuals potentially lose their jobs and their livelihoods too. And I think this is why I'm very frustrated at where we are when it comes to thinking about this budget. And I think we need to really think through um, who 
can do this type of work, we really need to think through, for example, the idea of the mental health, mental health crisis team. A, lot, a number of people brought this up. Well, I think this needs to be done in partnership. Um, it, it would not be responsible for me to have sent crisis um, workers who are unarmed to uh, conflicts where maybe there are armed individuals who are experiencing mental health crises. You need partnerships. And I think there needs to be a much better reimagining of how do we treat addiction as the disease that it is, rather than incarcerating people with the disease? Um, how can we also have programs um, that um, that work that draw upon all the resources of society so that ultimately we are going as upstream as possible and investing in our youth while also recognizing the many demands that our police officers as i think chief hall very well said um too that the men, that they are also under heavy um demands and therefore must also have the resources to do their jobs i appreciate that the, the reimagining the public safety budget is a, a great subheading for our idea of reimagining the future of public safety i think that that's so very important um, David, if you could, please tell us about the National Network and your work and how you think about the concept of resourcing appropriate interventions that are non-police interventions uh, in terms of public safety, public public health, and, and violence interruption. I, I will I will do that. I, I have to say I'm I'm reeling a little bit from uh, Dr. Dr. Wynn's opening datum. I, I guess it's good to know that even after doing this kind of thing all this time, you can still be shocked. Um, I, I did not know that fact about BPD over time versus the city of Baltimore public public health budget. That that is genuinely shocking. Um, and you know, very nearly enough said. Um, but uh, to say more, so. You know, I'm I'm sitting here in, in New York City, and New York City in in this this world of, of gun violence prevention that, that I live in is is known uh, nationally for its extraordinary investment and and network of city and, and community agencies around gun violence prevention. So the the mayor's office of gun violence, which is uh, you know, two administrations old, basically, in New York City, has what's probably the most purposeful and robust uh, public public health-inspired uh, focus budget network of, of community non-law enforcement action around violence prevention and violence interruption of, of anywhere in the country. Um, Dr. Wynn is, of course, right. The, the evaluations on, on these things are very positive. Uh, my colleague Jeffrey Butts at, at the Research and Evaluation Center at John Jay has the same sort of data here that Dr. Wen cited about safe streets in Baltimore. It, this is almost certainly a major part of the reason that, that, that at least before the pandemic, New York had seen exactly what we want to see in this, in this area. It had seen dramatic reductions in arrests, uh, in, in, in citations, uh, in prosecutions, which is, of course, something that, that DA Gonzalez has been part of driving. Um, jails down, prisons down, everything on the criminal justice side is down. And violence in New York City had, had continued to plummet to the point that that again before the pandemic last calendar year a city that once saw 2250 homicides a year had has seen less than 300 in caliber uh, calendar 2019. so lots to be proud of there and to, to dr wen's points stated another way this this extraordinarily important you know national leadership commitment that New York City has made to non-criminal justice violence prevention uh, boasts a budget of about $35 million. And that makes it stand out nationally. That's a really big deal nationally. Um, NYP, NYPD's budget is $10.5 billion. This is just you know, obviously so fundamentally off balance. And 
the the national network uh, kind of operates in in the spaces between these these realities. Uh, we 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 do immediate hands on violence prevention. Uh, we we are sort of the the ER equivalent of of these these deep structural investments that are so important. We we deal with the the here and now and the right now. And what what David Muhammad has been speaking to is that in in fact there's an extraordinary amount that has been learned about how to do this work right now. Um, as Dr. Dr. Wynn has said, um, in inappropriate relationship with with police and and others in the criminal justice system, but the the community side of this is is critically important. It it does work. It can be made to work. The more work that it does, the the less work that that the police and the rest of the criminal justice system need to do. David's work in in Oakland, California, is is a signal example of this. That that steadily over six seven years, um, this portfolio in Oakland, which was not that long ago a city that was known nationally for its its irreducible violence, people had had essentially given up on on violence in Oakland. And homicide and gun violence in Oakland is down 50%, or at least before the pandemic was down 50, going on 60%. Arrests in Oakland down 50%. And I'm, I, I'm very familiar with this work. And, and steadily over that time, the share of that work done by the Oakland Police Department has, has become steadily smaller. The share of the work done by community action has gotten steadily bigger. The relationship between those community actors and, and the Oakland Police Department have gotten steadily better. And it is, it is simply core common sense and a fundamental matter of racial justice and racial equity to do everything we can to to consciously build up those community capacities. You said a lot in that, David, which I think will bring us into a really important part of this conversation, which is uh, what's the what's next? Because what you just said, especially about New York as a model, the relatively modest investment, even though it's record by other standards in non-criminal justice uh, interventions in New York, the 35 million versus the 10 and a half billion invested in the in NYPD, what we want to do on these conversations, and, and this was basically why John Jay and Noble came together is say, how do we get from here to there? So I'm gonna come back to that in a second, but I, I wanna bring in uh, DA Gonzal Gonzalez and Candace, if we could, because I, I think uh, it'd be great to hear from the funder perspective about budgets and how you're seeing a public welfare foundation, Candace, uh, the question of investment and making up the gap and operating in that space between that David just identified. And also for uh, DA Gonzalez, uh, particularly um, some of the commitments that he has made at the beginning of his tenure and followed through on since uh, are really important in framing how we can start to do things differently. Candace, if you can kick us off, that'd be great. I think in philanthropy, one of the things that's really important is to sort of be one of the first uh, investors, right, to invest in innovation. The theory is really that in philanthropy, you can test models and sort of absorb risks that a lot of time public systems cannot because they like to rely on evidence-based practices. I say that with huge caveats about really the quality of data that we rely on when making even big public investments. But that's at least the theory we are all operating under. And so I do think it's really important for philanthropy to be willing to support some of these innovations and to support them in a way that sort of proves out a test case for jurisdictions that are thinking about doing something differently, that something different is possible. I think what's also really fundamentally important though is that we look at what exists. You know, I, I'm gonna leave David Muhammad some runway to talk about the incredible work that he has done in Oakland. 
David Kennedy talked a lot about the innovations that have happened in New York, but frankly, there are other places where those things have also happened, right? Also in LA, while you saw a decline in crime and people being committed, at the same time, you saw a really significant investment in a continuum of care. And so there are multiple jurisdictions where it's like these two things existing in tandem, you actually see the result that we say that we all want. So it's really important to note that. And I do think that philanthropy should be doubling down on that. We have, especially in the space of criminal justice and criminal justice reform as a field focus for a very long time on sentencing policy and reform, which has been critically important to getting us where we are now. But so much of the framing has been about what we want to see less of, right? We want to see less Black men dying at the hands of police in the very systems, and not exclusively police, having run a correctional system. I know that beyond the places where those videos are available, there are also existing horrors, but we wanna see less of that, less of these harsh penalties that we don't think actually net us the result that we want. And we wanna see more investments in things like Credible Messenger, in innovations that I hope the DA will talk about like common justice and these alternatives, because we actually see data, common justice and the Alliance for Safety and Justice that shows that actually victims of crime you know, would engage in some alternatives if they believe those alternatives were available. We always fall back on these ideas that the communities are asking for these things, the communities are asking for these things. And I don't think that that's untrue. But the truth is that if you're thirsty and somebody gives you a dirty cup of water, it's all you have to drink, you're going to drink it. But I think if you have been given a myriad of options, as we often see in more affluent communities, it's also like Safety is not something that hasn't happened yet as we rethink it. We manage to deliver it to affluent communities in this country every day. But when you've been given a myriad of options as other communities see, then you select different things. And so I think it will be important for philanthropy to begin to bet on those innovations, but it's also to really pay attention and acknowledge the things that already exist. And I'll just tease out and hold up again a point that David Muhammad made earlier that I think is so important. That advancement, that investment can't represent cents on the dollar. When you hear about credible messengers and the work that happened in New York being replicated in DC, his work in Oakland, in LA, Chicago, Cure Violence, where I'm from and did a ton of work throughout my career. Oftentimes, the first things to be cut in a budget crisis are those programs, right? They are considered soft and easy to go. But even when fully funded, they're not funded in a way that respects the individuals out doing the job and sacrificing themselves that encourages professional development and certification and the kind of living wage that allows you to grow and really deliver strong in a job. And so I think it will also be really important as we test these models in philanthropy, but transfer them to public budgets that we ensure that investment is actually what it should be. I love that. The, the idea of risk tolerance for philanthropy and testing innovations and being able to transfer to public budgets is, is critical. And also another tagline, investment in a continuum of care. I, I think that sort of frames up a lot of what we're talking about. And I'd love to come to D.A. Gonzalez and, and then to Chief Hall after that to talk about you, know, you, you sit in those positions of institutional power and are speaking the language of reform. And so bridging a lot of the gap that we're thinking about, dialogue across difference. And uh, the purpose of these conversations is to be able to figure out what it is that we're not doing that we can seize on in this moment of opportunity that will propel us forward, fully understanding that it may not be new. And, and that's part of what, what I'd love to, to hear from both of you, which is uh, how you've seen progress thus far during your tenure and what you wanna see going forward, given that work that you already started to put into place. Now, let's start with Dan Gonzalez, if you please. So I wanna piggyback a little bit on what Candice uh, was talking about, because you know I think Part of the solution for police and for prosecutors is to innovate and to listen to our communities about what we need um, and not take, you know, not to have to be in the forefront. You know, we may have to take a step back and be diminished in the process somewhat. So for me, innovation in this area looks like sharing the ability and the, and the, and the you know, the power to um, decide what happens to cases with community members. And I think that, you know, we're looking at a, a pilot program where we um, respond to the precinct after an arrest with community-based uh, organizations to take a look at, should this case even be prosecuted? Does it 
Does it need to be prosecuted? Are there diversions that we can do right at the scene that would increase safety and uh, avoid sort of the trauma of an arrest situation? And um, and if it and if it does need to be prosecuted, um, what does the community like to see the outcomes to be? You know, why does the district attorney uh, only decide um, what? is right and appropriate and necessary in that case. What is the community response to that? And so sharing this power, this decision-making uh, may sound radical, but it's really what should be happening. If we're listening to the needs of our community, if we, we want to actually be responsive to their sense of safety and their concern, and, and quite frankly, we know that you know many of the, the, these arrest situations that we're talking about are coming out of black and brown communities. Um, this is the children of our community um, or the members of our community and the outcomes matter to that community. And so listening, um, but also being willing to take a step back and let other people have a say in what um, the outcome should look like. And then, as we've been talking about budgets, making sure that we're building community by investing in those uh, ability to service and to restore people back in their community by building up those resources. Like having that community-based organization or those stakeholders actually have the list of services in their community and figure out what services need to be there. And then the DA and other elected should support them to get those services. And if we did that, uh, we'd get to a thriving community. We'd get to a place of increased public safety. Let me stick with you for a second, Diego Gonzalez, because you said something that's really important. Well, two things. Number one, listen, respond, and innovate is a great triad, but the, the humility that you just put your finger on in naming power sharing with the community as a sitting elected official is just unique, and it's not something you hear often. So uh, if you could, it'd be great to hear a little bit about how you thought about that and how you've executed on that uh, during your tenure so far. We, we've started, um, you know, we've contracted with service providers to respond to precincts uh, in a program called Brooklyn Clear, and that is with substance uh, use disorder, saying the DA doesn't have to be involved in helping to get you treatment. We don't need our courts and our judges um, involved in that. We can provide um, service. And so we work through our office and our budget to provide people who have been um, peer counselors to help get people into treatment. We'll give them a window to do so. And if they um, substantially get themselves involved in services and we don't decide what the services are the professionals decide what that person may need um, then we just i decline to prosecute the case you know in terms of what we're looking to do um, in our pilot with uh, power sharing with the community is we've we've identified community-based organizations that have been long-standing and say these cases are coming in, this is a, a, an arrest for someone who continuously goes into the corner store and is stealing, or this is a, a situation that's happening here, how can we resolve this together? Because I can put the person in jail for six months and we know they're gonna come out and they're gonna still have many of the same problems that they had that led them to the conduct in the first place. So we need people in the community that are invested in these people, 95% um, you know, of the people uh, but we deal with return directly back into the neighborhoods at some point. So um, it, it really is a matter of saying services that we help provide uh, and we let professionals, you know, the um, social service providers decide what that person needs, as opposed to I send someone to court and the judge says, okay, you're going to do this, you're, we're going to do that. Um, and if the person doesn't complete services, the result is they um, wind up going upstate jail, spending more money, um, and ultimately not solving their problem. So we're going to have these people, we're going to meet them at the precinct. Some of those are going to be direct um, decline to prosecute a promise of services right there. Some of them are going to be, we're going to move forward with the case, but we're still going to look at services. And in, in some cases, you know, a traditional prosecution model may be necessary in that case, but those are going to be decisions that we share with our community members. 
I'm really grateful for those insights and especially for our viewing audience to hear directly from you on how you're thinking about that kind of community engagement and power sharing and especially the declination to prosecute, which is such a powerful tool and underused by, by so many district attorneys. That is uh, just a wonderful set of, of insights. Uh, Chief Hall, if I can come to you for some reflections on the, the same question, as you sit in the chief of police in the city of 1.3 million people, uh, when you frame up uh, where we should be going and how we get from here, our current moment, our reawakening and another reckoning on racial justice and police practices, knowing all that we know and all of your expertise in law enforcement and your community leadership, uh, what is the gap between where we are now and where we want to be? I think you may be muted, Chief. I'm sorry, I, I was muted. Um, th thank you for the question. I do want to acknowledge um, DA Gonzalez uh, for the innovation. Uh, we started this particular portion of the conversation around uh, defunding or reimagining. Um, and I don't support to defund the police, but I do believe in reimagining because, because it is everyone's responsibility uh, to ensure public safety. And I acknowledge DA Gonzalez because his budget is being used to ensure that there are alternatives to uh, incarceration and or uh, supplementing what the police department is able to do. And that is the premise around reimagining. It is not just falling upon policing uh, for the responsibility of ensuring equality and quality of life for our communities. Everyone plays a role, everyone's budget is as equally important to this process as law enforcement. And so we all must come to the table. We all must sit down and acknowledge what are the fundamental responsibilities in making our individual communities more safe. They are as diverse as we are on this panel. And so with that, everyone has to uh, come to the table and make sure that that's uh, a a focus. Now, what I am not saying is that it is that the police uh, departments don't have a responsibility to relinquish some of our responsibilities uh, as it relates to responding to these things. Here in Dallas, we have a right care program. It's a partnership with our uh, a philanthropic group, some of our private uh, entities uh, and our, our uh, uh, mental health professionals, our Parkland Hospital, as well as our fire department which puts clinicians in our 911 center uh, and creates a right care team that is dis mm -hmm. dispatched uh, to mental health uh, calls to ensure that they get the proper resources. That is a collaboration of everyone being at the table, the right people at the table, the right people putting in their resources. It is incumbent upon our elected officials. It is uh, incumbent upon our businesses, our clergy, everyone to ensure that the resources that are needed in a community are actually there. So I do commend the DA for the things that he's doing. Uh, and it's up to us sitting in this seat as a, a, as a police uh, chief and being responsible to not only the police department, but every member in this community. Uh, we must ensure that everyone has a seat at the table and everyone is heard about what their specific needs are. And then we all work together to ensure that those needs are met. Um, the, the, the one thing that, that was truly important that I heard is um, as we talk about uh, being progressive and having alternatives for the individuals in our community, that's uh, so fundamental because when we're responding as law enforcement to those uh, lower level crimes, uh, such as a theft from a store, uh, when you have progressive DAs who say, we're not going to prosecute those individuals, um, then as police uh, response, we need to know then what else? If you're not going to, re to, to prosecute these individuals, we're wasting our time going to these locations, but we're there because of the quality of life for our respective business owners um, and businesses in that community. And they are expecting service from law enforcement. So when we respond, we have to have something to do with these individuals that keeps them from coming back to that location because this impacts our economic growth and development if we're unable to keep service to these individuals, keep their businesses thriving, that impacts everything that happens in a city. 
So um, understanding that there's a huge responsibility uh, for law enforcement uh, to continue to provide a service and ensure that these individuals are um, addressed and provided the, 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 the resources that they need. We need the resources to be able to be available through mobile crisis units um, and things that we have reimagined in the Dallas uh, police budget this year. And so I'm just grateful that there are individuals around this panel across this country that are having the same conversations, recognizing that it is bigger than law enforcement. It is, it, And it takes us working together and not just looking at our budget, but looking at every budget and to see how we can, as a city, ensure that the things that need to be addressed in this in in our respective areas and in this country as a whole are addressed thank you so much chief in particular uh, the idea that you need to have that something else if we're not prosecuting or we don't want police as first responders is really critical and and especially uh, something we haven't talked about a lot about yet but the, the collateral effect on the economy and the and that in order for our cities to continue to thrive. It's not just the moral imperative to do policing right and for it to be just and fair, but the collateral consequence to not just families, but also businesses that are the lifeblood of, of our economy is, is something that we haven't talked a lot about yet, but I appreciate you raising and bringing into the conversation. Uh, I actually wanna bring in uh, Dr. Wen uh, before uh, we, we get back to to David Muhammad, because Dr. Wen, I know you have a heart out at, uh, at five. Uh, one of the things that we do uh, so far in these conversations that I, I think is fun and has got some really interesting answers uh, for at, at the end of the conversation. So we'll preview with you here is the three things that you would like to see happen right now that you think would take us forward and allow us to take significant strides towards a new conception of public safety. I, I think you may be so, muted. Um, oh, there we go. Yeah, um, well, it's a great question. And I will make sure that I also watch the video um, to see what the other respondents respond to because I have the first crack at this. So um, here are um, three things that, that come to mind. One, we talked about a bit already, but I just want to put that on the table that I think every community can reimagine the public safety budget. And again, I'm not saying defund the police, but reimagine the public safety budget. Maybe think about it in combination with public health. What is it that we're trying to do? Who is best to do what service? And really think through that concept of partnership. Second, I want us to invest in what works. In communities all around the country, there are effective interventions. There are effective interventions through the police department. There are effective partnerships. There are effective public health um, measures. Um, many people have talked about diversion programs. One program that we in Baltimore had copied from Seattle and that is also duplicated across the country is law enforcement assisted diversion, where lead, where individuals who are caught with small amounts of drugs will be offered treatment instead of incarceration. Violence prevention programs like the Safe Streets Cure Violence model that I talked talked about is another effective intervention. And I hope that we will also look at these. And even if they're not traditional policing practices, understand that they also contribute to this overall goal of public safety and make sure that we invest in what is already working in our communities. The third concept is, or the third takeaway, if you will, is I hope we'll also um, have a better understanding of how interrelated all of these issues are. There's a concept in public health about going upstream. And it's a fable. It's a fable of um, how there are three friends who are walking along and they see a stream and there are children who appear to be drowning. And so the first friend jumps in and tries to rescue these children who are drowning, but there are too many children and this person is only able to rescue some. The second person sees a dam and says, wow, that dam is broken. I'm going to go fix the dam. The third friend keeps on running and the first two say to him, why, are you, why aren't you helping now? And the third person says, I want to see who is throwing in these kids in the first place. That's the concept of public health, the concept that we need to be looking at prevention. I want us to be looking at preventing lead poisoning and getting glasses for children and investing in school health as also a measure that improves public health, but ultimately improves public safety because it gives children the best opportunity to survive and to thrive too. I certainly want us to also look at the trade-offs that are involved when you have, and David, I'm glad to be able to give you a statistic that that, that still surprises you, but when you have a situation of, um, of such disinvestment in public health, 
um, um, uh, that you know that the numbers are are um, are so disproportionate in favor of other services that may also be important, but really we're not investing public health. Is it any surprise that we're now seeing COVID nineteen dominate everything else that we do, and uh, therefore also hurt our our sense of safety and also hurt our economy the way that it has? And so. I know these issues are really challenging, but I also think it's important for us to start somewhere, wherever it is that we can, even if we're the person who is pulling kids out when they're drowning. That's my job in the ER too, saving people when something really has gone wrong. But if we are able to intervene much earlier in that process, we should also take that opportunity and save lives now. Thank you Thank so you much, so Dr. Wen, for uh, for being with us and uh, for those three things, which I think are great to reimagine the public safety budget, to invest in what works, and then to remember the parable of the stream and, and thinking about working further and further upstream to prevent problems in the first place. It's a, a perfect way to close out. We very much appreciate your leadership voice and public health perspective of with us on the panel. Thank you. If we can uh, come back to David Mohammed. Um, David, you've been uh, shouted out a couple of times here for the work that you've done on non-criminal justice intervention. So would love if, uh, as DA Gonzalez and, and Chief Hall did, if you could just speak to some of the programming that you think works best and that you've worked on, because we really want to be able to explode and unpack uh, what it is we're talking about when we say resource, resource alternatives, what it is we're talking about when we say equitable budgets and funding that can't be pennies on the dollar, as you identified earlier. Yeah, so a couple, and I'll try to, to go quick because I think there's a number of uh, uh, lessons uh, or things to glean from uh, some of the work that uh, we've been able to be involved in. Involved in. And, I'll, and I'll, I'll talk specifically about Oakland. My organization works uh, in many cities around the country, uh, but we're based in Oakland and have done a lot of different, uh, worked on a lot of different strategies. Uh, number one is the uh, gun violence reduction strategy. A ceasefire where we have taken many of the principles and the extraordinary work laid out uh, by David Kennedy over the years and we use that as a base foundation and built on it uh, with other programs and services and strategies. Uh, There's really a, a four-pronged approach of using data to identify people at the very highest risk of being involved in gun violence. Uh, we, we, we can do that effectively. Uh, secondly, communicating uh, that risk to them respectfully and directly. Uh, it's kind of like the COVID risk of people who are over a certain age and have underlying health conditions, informing them that they are at higher risk of, of, of not only uh, getting the uh, uh, virus, but also having worse health call outcomes from it. It's a similar process. Uh, third is connecting them to a array of services, supports, and opportunities, an intensive array of services, supports, and opportunities, and not expecting initially that someone is going to go from the highest risk person in the city to tomorrow gainfully employed and, and problem free. Uh, but understanding that we're first giving them a relationship so that the discussion of credible messenger we talked about before is connecting these folks to somebody who's going to have a relationship with them. And then they use that relationship to gain influence with them. And they use that influence to help uh, the, the decision making process. And they, they use that to help folks have better outcomes. Uh, and fourth in this Oakland uh, strategy is an enforce, uh, focus enforcement uh, portion of it. Uh, and in fact, in Oakland, what we have done is said that's where enforcement should focus uh, its its work is around uh, uh, the gun violence. And in any city, it's actually a small, small, small part of what law enforcement responds to and focuses on. And so uh, with with some success in being able to reduce the 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 footprint of law enforcement, as, as David Kennedy mentioned, we have had actually a two thirds reduction in the amount of arrests over uh, the past seven or eight years um, while having a 50 percent reduction in shootings and homicide. Uh, and so uh, that has been an effective strategy. The funding, uh, the, the services side of that has been funded out of an innovative approach. It is an approach actually that the, the Public Welfare Foundation highlighted in an incredible video uh, that they produced, which is a voter initiative uh, that funds uh, $10 million a year in violence reduction services. There's a separate fund for prevention services. This is specifically for intervention, near-term reductions in violence, 10 million a year. That same initiative actually gives the police 12 million a year and gives fire 2 million a year. 
uh, and it was approved by voters twice, a 10 year initiative and then a, and, a, and it was renewed for another 10 years. So a very innovative approach there. Um, two other very quick things. One is an uh, organization was recently involved with the police department to launch uh, the NOAB, the Neighborhood Opportunity and Accountability Board. In fact, when Jay Gonzalez was in Oakland a while back, we talked about this and, and we, after a lot of preparation, uh, finally launched. And it's a, quite an innovative approach. We're at the arrest level. Police are diverting young people arrested for felonies. Uh, and we worked on that for a while, made sure they were comfortable and we had the, the legal uh, analysis to say they can do it. Uh, and so we have several young people, there's more than, there's nearly 30 young people who've been referred in the last four months uh, who are arrested for relatively serious felonies who are devoted at the point of arrest to a community process. We have community leaders, uh, business owners, formerly incarcerated uh, folks, uh, former victims of uh, a crime who sit as a council. The idea is to kind of go back to the days of, of village councils or council of elders uh, or tribal councils who sat and adjudicated or, or, or administered justice, right? In a restorative developmental way. Uh, and so we've done that uh, in Oakland and, and have launched this in Oakland to, you know, we're six months in, so we're early, but pretty extraordinary success of young people who would have otherwise been in detention, who would have otherwise been on probation, very costly, uh, a negative system. Uh, six months in, we've had zero rearrests uh, and a very community-based uh, uh, process. Uh, the last thing I'll say is uh, the city council, the city of Oakland voted unanimously to create a reimagining public safety task force and, and task that task force with uh, coming up with recommendations to reduce the, the police department's general fund budget by 50%. Uh, and then uh, after doing that, they uh, asked my organization to co-lead that process. And so we kicked that task force off last night, 17 extraordinary uh, commissioners. Uh, and so we have a process up until April of next year uh, to produce several recommendations to the city uh, around more community-led uh, public safety initiatives. Thank you so much, David. And, uh, I want to bring in uh, David Kennedy on the on this question because something that you just said, uh, David Muhammad, uh, about uh, the task force that's kicked off, the the programming that you're doing, which is is fantastic. Uh, one of the things that uh, I keep coming back to is uh, we've analyzed. Uh, violence reduction, police violence, uh, safe communities in, since time immemorial, right? We have a lot of data and a lot of information. We can always have better data, but we've got a lot. And so part of what uh, what I come back to is we've got current commission 1969 through the 21st Century Policing Task Force of 2014-2015, essentially saying substantially similar things, which we, we, we've heard echoes of all of those uh, with great specificity uh, from each of our panelists here and in our prior conversations. Uh, I'd love to dig into what you see as the obstacles to scale and the obstacles to institutionalization of these alternative approaches, which have proven to be so effective. And especially when you consider the relatively small investments that have been made, yet the outsized results that you have seen, uh, what is it that, that creates that chasm between seemingly um, the, the right path that you would expect a lot of support for and investment in, and the fact that we're still having the same conversations we've been having for decades about what it takes to create uh, a safe community. Um, so I'm going to be very blunt here. Please. These, these issues um, and outcomes that we are talking about are not the weather. Right. They don't just happen. These, these are the results of people making decisions. And it is, it is those decisions that have created uh, the world that we live in, that we're, we're, we're talking about, that, that everybody essentially finds so unsatisfactory. And it, it will change when the people who are elected and appointed to make these decisions start making different decisions. But this, this, this isn't complicated. Um, yeah, David Mohammed and I are part of, of a, a, a dedicated national community that's been, been doing the sort of work that, that he's just talked about for, for decades now. Uh, we've known for a very long time that it works 
it's been made to work over and over and over again across the country. And for the longest time, over and over again, uh, those extremely successful initiatives were allowed to founder and fall apart. And, and David and I and the other people in this world were repeatedly asked and asked ourselves, how do you institutionalize this? How, how, how do you keep it going? And we, we took that on. Uh, we thought about all sorts of, of structural and metric and accountability. Um, we, we killed ourselves to try to keep these things going. And what we should have realized all along uh, is the answer is when, when people whose job it is to do this work care enough, they will keep these things going. And that, that has, in fact, turned out to be true in this portfolio over, over decades um, as elected and appointed folks have taken this seriously, the work gets done. And so this, this is about um, especially elected officials. It is about legislatures and, and mayors and presidents, um, city councils. It is about the appointed officials of, of city managers and police chiefs and, and people who run these city agencies. Uh, if they decide they want to do something different, then different things will happen. And that, that of course, makes it fundamentally a political question. It's about what, what is expected of them, what they feel accountable for. And, and that's why the current civil rights mo moment is so incredibly important because it is making people who felt that they didn't have to care about this realize that they have to care. The, the, the polity will not accept anything else. And, and that is tremendously hopeful. I appreciate that so much, and David. Like the, the idea, uh, these are fundamentally political questions and that all of the, the incredible work that you and everybody else on this panel have done over the course of your careers uh, exists in direct relationship to uh, our elected and appointed officials and the decisions that they make. Uh, and for that reason, I wanna bring in Candace, if we can, uh, for a perspective on this because you, know, you run a correctional system you've had to deal with budget season uh, and, and when it comes to criminal justice administration um, we'd love to get your views uh, now on uh, this moment and the reality that, that david has surfaced about our need to move forward but the fact that this goes directly through uh, the filter of political decision making uh, that's something that, that we don't often bring into the conversation about policy and practice but i think is really important for us to acknowledge and discuss yeah no i i definitely uh remember those budget seasons which frankly as dr Wynn pointed out policy is made in budget there's no question about it you see administrations every day issue press releases about lots of things and you know hold conferences and then the action just sort of fizzles and goes away um but a lot of times when a you know municipal state federal budget is released, you see a lot less conversation about what's actually happening there. And that is where all of the action is. The budget director I worked with once told me, I'm mostly paying attention to the person who's standing at this door every day. And I think to underscore the point David Kennedy made, which is because we're focusing on communities of color, which are not given the respect that they deserve, the fact that it has to be even a louder and more profound and consistent call to demand the type of investment that's necessary is really important. Um, I will offer to you on the point of scale, really uh, a thing that I think is also critically important is having a concrete thing that we're asking for. One of the things that I think I would love to see is a credible messenger service corps, right? We will use public resources to send all kinds of people to communities of colors to respond, except actually using those resources to invest in the people that are there already stepping up and providing a service. So we have have lots of money flowing from the Department of Justice policing. We have lots of money through service corps funding Teach for America, which allows sort of students, oftentimes affluent students, to come into community of color and help and service here in these different models. And I would actually love to see that infrastructure and funding 
put behind a core that actually gets us to scale on credible messengers, cure violence, and some of these innovations that we've spent a considerable amount of time on this call talking about. I think having those kind of concrete proposals of the things we would like to see, models like in Colorado, where they did take money, and I think that's a, once also a point that I'd like to make a little bit finer. I actually, you know, I appreciate the chief's position, but I do believe that if we are articulating a vision where we rely less on law enforcement, then a comparable reinvestment of dollars is not beyond the pale, right? It does, you know, like we have to say that having a budget where overtime sort of represents the comparable agency of public health is actually not acceptable. And so I think what you saw in Colorado was them taking money out of the deep end of their prison system and saying, we're going to fund this continual care of community organizations that are there to provide services and supports to reintegrate returning citizens. I think that we're actually going to have to really start to articulate and advocate for scaled investment in those types of models. Thanks so much, Candace. Yeah, policy being made in budget. Um, uh, amen to that. Uh, and the idea of a credible messenger service core, that, that's something I hope we get to uh, lift up and run with in one way or another, because that's brilliant. Um, I want to get to Diego Gonzalez and Chief Holland here for the same question. You're both sitting officials, elected and appointed. And, and this is uh, one of the most challenging things I'm sure that you face in thinking about your budget, budget allocations and budget season. Uh, talk to us uh, about how you think about that given the innovative uh, programming and approaches that you described earlier. Diego, well, Dallas, please. Interesting because you know, our budgets are um, decided um, by a political process. You know, we have a, a request that we, we make and, and but it's, there's very little room in our budgets uh, for innovation. And so it does become a matter of, you know, what your priorities are and what you're looking to do with it, because um, it, it, at least currently, especially in this uh, climate that we have right now in New York City, you know, we've, ha we've had to give back money and money has been taken away from the agency for other purposes, but we don't see those investments going back into the communities that we, we service. Um, you know, I've looked at my budget and have made uh, decisions to fund things directly uh, through my budget, much to do with uh, young people and adolescents and um, not just sports, we do some of that as well, but doing things to keep them in school and after school. And, and so there've been monies that we've put aside um, from the budget, which is really taxpayer dollars to um, do things that may be considered traditionally out of the role of the district attorney's office. But there's also been money um, that we've taken from our communities through enforcement actions that have come out of, you know, uh, forfeitures and, and other kind of seizures. And those um, monies have come really at the at the expense of the communities where those incidents took place. And so those monies are what I use to uh, fund a lot of the activities that we're doing. Because if, we're, if, if we um, recover a certain amount of money, um, that comes out of illegal, you know, drug operations or, you know, um, money laundering. And there's a lot of ways that this is happening. Um, what we try to do with it is try to do um, restitution to victims and, and communities. But that money should be um, reinvested into our communities. And so that's how I, I try to fund a lot of the things that we're doing in our community. You know, we, we've run a, a number of programs very directly that I think people would say, well, that's not really what a DA does, but you know, SAT prep and, and, and trying to just get our, our young people um, you know, out of the justice system. And also, I, I mean, quite frankly, I, I think this is an important piece that people should not only get to know a prosecutor because they were a victim of a, of a crime or they sh or it's simply um, because someone they love is being prosecuted, but because we have a role in public safety and because we have a role in making our communities you know, thrive, um, reinvesting um, th those funds. So for me, it, it's a combination of using the taxpayer funded um, dollars to do um, unique and interesting and things that make a difference, but then also looking at the funding that we can provide to organizations and groups um, that we take um, back out of the community and making sure that they're not spent 
on uh, you know getting bigger televisions in the office or you know buying cars with them or some of these those traditional forfeiture uses that you probably understand that it's done in law enforcement, but really just giving that back directly to community uh, programming and community functions. Uh, that's really helpful. And it, it sounds like a, a version of the listen, respond, innovate, but in the budget context that you talked about earlier when thinking about your interventions and how you um, think about managing your office. Um, Chief Hall, the same question to you as well, please. So thank you. Um, and just to piggyback off of DA Gonzalez, uh, we do uh, our budget process is a, a political process. Um, and what we do is make recommendations. So my recommendation came from listening uh, to the community. Uh, this year, as we always do. I've had an advisory board since uh, the day I arrived uh, and listening to what their needs were. And so some of the recommendations uh, for our budget this year uh, allowed us to uh, push forward to more community-based pro uh, programs to uh, extend our Right Care program, what I talked about earlier, which is a partnership with the fire department and our uh, uh, public health uh, committees and to ensure that we're providing the right care to our uh, mentally, uh, mental health challenged uh, individuals. Uh, also, uh, we recommended taking some of our uh, funds and uh, creating a mobile crisis unit. Our mobile crisis unit uh, would answer those calls for service that oftentimes come to directly to the police department of individuals sleeping on the street or homelessness. Um, and those that those resources would go to provide individuals uh, to respond to those locations and provide the resources or connect them to the resources that they need, taking that responsibility from the police department. They would take the monies associated with that. We would regain our capital, which is our officers, uh, to be able to divert them uh, to priority one uh, calls uh, for service. Uh, so we also uh, looked at our projected overtime budget for the year and decrease that by about $6 million to ensure that there were other uh, monies available for the city to utilize um, as it relates to additional uh, public service facing activities and or resources for the community. We heard the community uh, when they spoke and we're listening. We do not disagree that the responsibilities that are on the police department are too many and they, they need to be uh, reallocated to individuals who are better equipped uh, to handle those those calls for service. Uh, we recognize that mental health coming to the police department, we get 40 hours of uh, critical incident training and that does not make uh, a clinician make. So we are focused uh, on this change that needs to happen. We are committed to that process. And so uh, we believe that having everyone at the table, uh, having our DA's office, having our uh, philanthropic companies, our businesses, uh, and our elected officials all on the same page, uh, ensuring that we're assessing the needs because it has to be about everybody understanding what those needs are. Our youth uh, programs uh, were primarily the responsibility of the uh, police department. So putting those on the table at budget time to spread those out to our parks and recs, that they would provide uh, that programming. Uh, for for uh, the city of a 1.4 million people. Uh, so it was things like that that we uh, recommended into the budget that the city manager uh, implemented most of those into the budget. It'll uh, go through a final process on September 23rd, uh, but to provide some context to our budget, it is $516 billion, um, I'm sorry, million dollars. And 88% of that is salaries and the other 12% is operational. So uh, when we try and trim the fat, there's very little fat to trim, uh, but we were uh, very intentional in listening and working with our community to ensure uh, that we were uh, doing our part and uh, allowing for some additional resources that were outside of the police department. 
Thanks so much, Chief, and uh, especially for raising, uh, as Dia Gonzalez did, that there isn't as much wiggle room as uh, as folks may think, but that even within that, you've both been extraordinarily creative, and, and it's good to be able to raise and surface so people know uh, how you're thinking about using your budgets and how you're going through those recommendations in the, as David said, inherently political process for those political questions. Uh, we are running out of time, sadly, it has flown by as ever it does, uh, but the last thing that I'd like to do for all of our, our panelists is to pose the same question that earlier we posed to Dr. Wen before she, she left, which is, oh, what are three things that you would like to see happen right now in order for us to be able to take functional steps forward in defining a new future of public safety, particularly with respect to black and brown communities and particularly with respect to the law enforcement community uh, that are in dialogue right now and that we want to see uh, get to some practical steps forward. And I'm going to start with uh, David Muhammad. All right. Uh, no time to think about. Uh, no. The, um, um, so number one, I would say we need, you know, real uh, reinvestment. And what I've talked about for years on the criminal justice reform uh, kind of framework is this notion of reduce, improve and reinvest, right? Reduce the uh, footprint of the criminal justice system, improve uh, what's left of it uh, and reinvest back into the community. Uh, and so that is uh, not just about police. Uh, in fact, that framework was created not, not even for police, but for uh, corrections. Uh, but as we see the rightful downsizing of the juvenile justice system, uh, for instance, we need to have that reinvestment, right? And so you've had a 60% reduction in juvenile incarceration in this country in the last, I think, six to eight years. And we've seen nowhere near the corresponding uh, reduction of those budgets and reinvestment in community in communities and community service. But we're seeing somewhat a reduction in jails and prisons, uh, a reduction in uh, community supervision, which there needs to be a massive reduction in uh, the amount of uh, people very unnecessarily under uh, probation or parole supervision. And that same focus on violence reduction should also exist uh, in corrections to focus on that small number of people that we know are at particularly high risk uh, and that we can do a better job with those folks and reduce the number uh, of unnecessary and ineffective correctional involvement and reinvest those that money, not just continue to stay the same size or it go back to the general fund, but to capture those savings and reinvest into effective uh, community-based services, as well as into community development. Uh, and so that that is a couple of steps. But the, the other thing I'll just say is, uh, is to be clear that this is what I tell cities all over the country, the, the great rocket science that I share with them is your activities should be aligned with your uh, desired outcomes. <laughs> and as uh, uh, as simple as that might be, so often we don't do that. We say we're going to reduce gun violence in the next 12 months. And so we're going to start a mentoring program for middle school students. And a, men a mentoring program for middle school students is awesome, uh, but it will never get you violence reduction in the next 12 months. Uh, or we're going to uh, reduce mental health challenges and we're going to you know take a bunch of folks with no mental health uh, training, right? So we really have to match our activities uh, with uh, our desired outcomes. And the last thing I'll say is uh, to repeat that the, we have to have real investment, not, not, not pennies on the dollar, invest in the community intervention uh, that we know is right at scale. Thank you so much, David. I'm gonna come to uh, Dia Gonzalez next. Uh, in order to produce public safety, I think that we have to, and, and you know, sometimes, uh, like-minded people find themselves and so there's a lot of uh, agreement in, in you know on this in this conversation but in general we have to let people uh, understand that public safety is not automatically increased and, um, by using jail as a primary function um, to achieve that goal that in many instances and, and often, the use of jail does not keep us safe. It actually causes more problems and, and in many ways keeps us not safe. And that the solutions to um, violence, 
is not necessarily incarceration, and the goal of the of this justice system should not simply be punishment, but it should be about changing people uh, in a positive way so that they can be restored in their community safely, and we can ha and we can actually live together and enjoy that. And so, just sort of the the culture of prosecution and policing that the um, enforcement action is the most powerful thing that we can do. Um, I think that has to change in culture. And, and really related to that is the sense that there has to be, people have to be uh, treated with human dignity in our justice system. Um, much of the, um, you know, the sentiment that the justice system doesn't work is simply because how people are treated from the moment that, you know, the, the encounter, the police encounter happens to the what my assistant district attorneys are doing in the courtroom and that lead up to incarceration. Uh, those things matter. Um, the trust in the justice system is often based on how we interact and how we treat with people and, and that we have to always be mindful that these are our brothers and sisters. And if we're thinking of them as others, which often we do in law enforcement, we think of them, you know, it's us versus them, um, we're failing. Uh, so I, I think that those are the things that I think are really um, incredibly powerful. Um, for me, the culture change aspect in the district attorney's office is, and part of my Justice 2020 initiative is that jail in the Brooklyn DA's office is considered a last resort. It's often, for me, considered a failure that we could not figure out any other solution to what we're dealing with than simply uh, um, seeking jail or incarceration. Um, and, and that has to be a more fundamental understanding that the community has, because as we're looking at the politics of the time, and it was mentioned earlier, the only options that, you know, the reason why there's so much, yeah, we want them arrested, we want the police to come, we want the police to take this enforcement action, is because we not we have not given communities other alternatives. And when we give them those other alternatives um, and, and other ways to feel safe, um, they often would choose that. And we know that very directly here, simply by the participation rates that we have from our community. They call for assistance and then the rest of the process is not what they want for themselves or for their community. Um, and so there's a very high non-participation rate in our cases. And in Brooklyn, that number is you know nearly 50% because um, we're not giving our communities what they need in order to actually feel safe, long-term safety. Um, the short-term safety, the immediate enforcement action, but the long-term safety is they understand that these people, um, our people, are going to be back in the community, and so simply locking up someone is uh, not, not going to be the solution. And so those things matter because once we can actually prevail that um, – the, the action of um, spending money to incarcerate someone is not going to keep us safer. Maybe we can get to a better situation where people are willing to invest in communities and think of other solutions. Um, and then our police department, and I, I, I you know, I, I want to say this because I, you know, was not directly said, um, our police department is a very important um, mechanism of public safety. And so it has to have the opportunity to focus in on drivers of crime and the other things that they need to do to keep us safe and, and change the narrative that the police department is responsible for all these other things that they're not designed to do. Thanks so much, Dia Gonzalez. I want to get other folks in because we are ever so slightly over time. David Kennedy, next, if you please. Sure. So you you asked for three. I could give you 30. I could give you 300. Uh, all, all of us could. We'll and take the I, other 297 yeah, after yeah. the fact, please. I've, I've uh, agreed with everything I've heard. I think I'm going to agree with everything I hear. So I'm just going to give you one. And I'm going to go back to where uh, I started, which is um, the the people have voted with with their bodies and they have said, we do not see the police as legitimate. We do not want them in our communities. And um, as, as the police will tell you, um, the police in many communities are, are effectively the government. 
They, they are the state 24 seven, a phone call away. They, they are effectively the government in, in the daily life of, of our communities. And if the government in the life of our community is not seen as legitimate, if it is not felt to be legitimate, if it is not wanted by by the people, uh, we will never ever get this right. And if if we don't create public institutions, um, not just in public safety but more broadly, but in this conversation about public safety, if if the role of the state is not seen by the people as legitimate. We will never, ever get this right. Thank you, David. Chief Hall. I think you may be muted. I keep doing that. <laughs> I apologize. Um, as Dr. Kennedy said, we could go on 300, um, but the three that I believe are, are the greatest. We're at a pivotal point uh, in society for change. And so what's greatestly, well, one of the most great um, that we can do is partner. Partnership is ideal right now. You know, in this country, it's either you support the police or you support Black Lives Matter. And there is no in between. And until we can have the conversation that they are both equally important. And we have been fighting since the beginning uh, to ensure that the Black Lives Matter, which is a powerful movement, which has always existed, whether it was called BLM or not, um, that it has always been a key factor for every one of us here on this panel today, that until we get to the table, sitting down, talking about what's important and a clear message about what each of us need to move forward, um, we can't move forward. Understanding that until uh, the politicians, elected officials uh, deal with what the key root causes of crime are, and that is understanding that there is a direct correlation between poverty and criminal activity, that the police department will still be seen as the oppressor because our responsibility is to be in those communities where crime is. And as a police chief, it's very difficult when you're held responsible for crime and the reduction of crime for you to put your resources where crime is not. So until we do those things and identify that we have to, 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 to deal with the root causes because police deal with the effects, until we deal with both of those things simultaneously, we're never going to be successful. And then police departments, across this country have to deal with the fact that we have to change. There is a need for us to change culturally. How we operate today has a direct reflect, a flex, re, reflection of how we've operated for many years. Um, we have uh, training that tells us what we should do. When someone escalates, we should escalate further. We need to move to what we could do and alternative solutions. We have been focused on it's important for our safety and for us to go home. It's about you as a police officer. We have to change that to it's about two. It's equally important for us to go home, but it's also important for the, the individuals that we come in contact with every day to be safe and, and, and secure after this encounter. There's change that needs to happen all across this country in every police department. And you have police chiefs across this country committed to that change. And so we need to make sure that the two sit at the table, the partners sit at the table and understand the commitment to change and what the community actually wants to see changed in those communities and do it. Thank you. Thanks so much, Chief. And Candace, if you would close us out. So much. Uh, it's tricky, right? Because there's so much rich stuff here. So I'll try to be as succinct as David Kennedy was. Uh, I talked about the, the service core. I'm going to leave on what I think is really important, which is sort of like a reframe, a reframe for the work and a reframe, frankly, even in the context of this conversation. So I think one thing that I would love to see and think is important is um, a sort of reclaiming of the word safety, which we have allowed to become synonymous with law enforcement. 
But I really believe each of us, if we were asked, even individually having spent significant portions of our own careers in that work, would not define things that are synonymous with suppression and incarceration. It is not actually what we think makes safe when we are sort of reflecting personally. Because I, and I think that reframe is gonna be important. I think it's important for the movements that are happening, um, but for even this work, because actually by reframing what safety really is, it forces us to acknowledge these other systems and types of investment that we think are critically important. Uh, the second thing is I think it is important for for, um, systems leaders to have resources and discretionary resources that they allocate appropriately. But I really do think, as David held up, it's incumbent on us all to be advocating loudly and ferociously for reinvestment. Uh, a system leader changes. I've had a job, don't have that job now, right? And you cannot control into perpetuity that someone else will be quite the visionary and leader that you are. And so making sure that we actually have infrastructure investment that will allow community reinvestment into the future will be so important. And then lastly, what I'll say is that, you know, I think in the field, we have to be careful of framing these conversations that we're having as progressive, even us. And the reason I say that is because so much at the core of what we're talking about is actually equity. I foreshadowed this earlier. We are trying to provide for communities of color, the kind of safety and supports and investment that we have been providing in affluent white communities forever. So I think we just have to be very careful about how we think about and talk about what we're doing, because the danger in that is actually not acknowledging the two realities that exist in tandem right now. That is a perfect way to close us out. Thank you so much, Candace. I want to say th thanks to DA Gonzalez, Chief Hall, David Muhammad, David Kennedy, and Dr. Wen, who was with us earlier uh, for this rich and robust and deep conversation. It's precisely what we're looking for in interrogating where we are in public safety right now, meeting this moment of racial justice reawakening and taking actual practical strides into the future. So I'm really grateful for all of your contributions. Uh, to our viewing audience, we have three more conversations upcoming in the next weeks and we look forward to digging in with more experts in the field to figure out how we capture a new future of public safety uh, thanks to the support of john jay college of criminal justice and the national organization of black law enforcement executives thanks so much everybody see you next time